The Bible is coming alive. The Bible is being fulfilled before our very eyes. And that's what Bible prophecy is. I've had a chance for the last 40 years to study Bible prophecy from the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I thank God that the Bible study of such events, uh, it never ends. We keep on studying and uh, we never learn it all. We're always learning and that's what Bible study really is. We may not know the day or the hour of Christ's return. It would be great. By human nature, we would like that. But you see, our nature is as such that if we knew that on such and such a day and time, we would do whatever we wanted to in sin, but on that day or right before, we would repent because we want to make it to heaven. But He kept us uh, without knowing. He doesn't hide things from us. He hides things for us. Somebody shout amen. So that we would simply be ready every day as though this were the day of His return. But we see what's going on all around us. convinced that the Jews are not of God and that to destroy them is a service to God. Not only is this a form of anti-Semitism, but this is a form of anti-Christianity. I'm going to say it again. When people are convinced that the Jews are not of God and that to destroy them is a service to God, we remember that verse of Scripture, not only is this a form of anti-Semitism, but this is a form of anti-Christianity. In fact, where you find anti-Semitism, you will find anti-Christianity because true biblical Christianity, I'm not talking about a man-made religion. It's because true Christianity embraces Israel and the Jewish people as a part of God's plan for the ages. That's why. With the fact that there has been so much hatred against the Jews along with the hatred towards Christians and true Christianity... This too is a sure sign of the times and a sign of biblical prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes. It really doesn't take much for someone outside of the will of God to allow an evil spirit of hatred to come into one's life. Not just against the Jewish people and the nation of Israel, but against other people. It was in the news this week. You may have heard about a satanic group that literally set up a satanic temple display inside the Iowa State Capitol in the city of Des Moines, Iowa. This display, how many of you saw this in the news? This display was set up at least until a Christian conservative man went in, tore it down, and destroyed these satanic items. The man's name was Michael Cassidy. It went public. He's a 35-year-old United States Navy fighter pilot and a Republican who recently ran for Mississippi's House District 45 just this last November. But because he took an initiative to tear those false altars down, he was arrested and charged with fourth-degree criminal mischief. When he was released from jail, he said these words, and I quote, I am a Christian man. I am a Christian conservative man who loves our nation and I am committed to preserving the blessings of liberty bestowed upon us by God and our founding generations. End of quote. Why point this out? I'll tell you why. I am convinced that this display and many others like it was set up not only as an allegiance to the devil, to Satan and his demon spirits, but it's an expression of hatred toward genuine Christianity. They didn't set this up during Halloween. The, the people that set that demonic altar up, they didn't do this in the middle of the summer. They did this at the Christmas season as an example of hatred towards Christianity and what real Christmas means. Do you understand? So when you see anti-Semitism, which is a hatred towards the Jewish people, there is automatically a connection with anti-Christianity, and that's what we're talking about today. So uh, I thank God for God exposing certain things. 
For a few moments, I want you to consider the life of a man by the name of Paul, as in the apostle. Before God changed his name to Paul, his name was Saul, and he would be referred to as Saul of Tarsus. And so before he came to know Jesus Christ personally, he believed in God, but not in the message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's possible to believe in God and to have religion and still not make heaven your home. Hello, I told you we were going to cover some ground which may seem to some as uncharted territory. He believed in God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was a Jewish man, but he did not believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. The Bible tells us that he persecuted those who had chosen to follow Jesus Christ, including some of his own countrymen who had accepted Jesus Christ and who had chosen to follow Jesus Christ and his way of living. In other words, Paul before he gave his life to Jesus, persecuted those of his own nationality, the Jews, if they too chose to be Christians, if they too chose to be followers of Jesus Christ. Through it all, he thought he was doing a service to God. He really did. And that's the reason why he said, I am the least of all the apostles, for I persecuted the church. And I thank God for a changed life. But I want you, keeping that in mind, to consider another man by the name of Stephen. Some call him Stephen. That's the common name. Stephen in the, old, in the New Testament pages of Scripture, in the book of Acts, actually. But he was stoned to death. And you might ask, why? Simply because he was a Christian. Now, that may sound ludicrous, preposterous. It may sound weird. Why persecute someone like Stephen because he was a Christian? Now, remember, Jesus had already said, they will kill you and put you in prisons because of me. Well, not only was Saul of Tarsus there, but he gave approval of what was happening to Stephen for following Jesus Christ. Here's why I want you to see this in Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. The Bible says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Because we need this, right? But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So he knew that his days or his moments were actually numbered. Did you see that? Stephen actually saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father. He saw this standing. You know, in most visions in Scripture of Jesus, the Son of God, at the right hand of God the Father. He is pictured as being seated at the right hand of God the Father. Bible students, you know what I'm talking about. In most of the scriptures that refer to Him as, the, as being at the right hand of God the Father. But in this case, Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. I like to believe that when one of God's faithful servants is getting ready to be with Him, He honors them by standing when they're ready to come through the portals of heaven. And I really believe that that is in store for you and I today. Whenever it is that God takes you home and He calls your name and He calls your number, I believe that every last one of us are given the opportunity to see Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father so as to honor the faith and the commitment that you and I have. Doesn't this inspire you? i got to be faithful to God. i got to be faithful and committed to Him all the way. I can't let anything Stand in the way. i got to make it to heaven. Somehow, the old gospel song says. But again, he pictures Jesus. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father so as to welcome one of his own in. Verse 55, one more time. But Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Verse 56. Be, uh, pay real close attention to this. He said, look. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. As they, at this they, meaning the people, the unbelieving people around him that were getting ready to stone him, at this they covered their ears. And yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. Dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. They uh, literally drugged Stephen out. I don't believe that he was fighting it. I really believe that they just did whatever they could to be mean because he was a Christian. So again it says, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. I find it interesting that verse 57 reveals that the unbelieving crowd, what did they do? 
they covered their ears. I'm going to say it again. They covered their ears and they yelled at the top of their voices the moment Stephen saw the glory of God and said in verse 56, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Do you suppose that a lot of people are still covering their ears when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to the truth of God's Word? Do you think a lot of people are still covering their ears? And it may not be just a physical thing. Ah, you know, when people don't want to hear it, people don't want to listen, you know. Uh, but there are a lot of people who can't stand to hear the way of the Lord. They may embrace religion, but reject Jesus Christ and His new way of living. They might even, those that are close to you, say something like, well, I'm happy for you and that you found religion. That's the way they say it. But keep it to yourself. I'm happy where I'm at. I was born a so-and-so, and they'll mention the denomination. I will have always been a so-and-so, and I will always be a so-and-so. So don't tell me about Jesus. That's a form of covering your ears. A lot of people cover their ears like that, and they don't even know why. They don't even know what they're doing. Someone under the sound of this voice, maybe you've been there. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. And uh, he wants you to hear what he has to say. It's a good word. Of the unbelieving but religious crowd, the Bible says in Psalm 115 and verse 5, they have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. Just because you have ears doesn't mean you're hearing unless you're really listening to the voice of God. You know what's amazing? God can speak. God speaks to every last one of us. It's just a matter of are you listening to Him? Jesus said it this way in Matthew 13, 15. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. But blessed Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. This is a good word, isn't it? Yeah. Let's get back to the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7. Stephen in Acts 7. I like that. There's a little rhyme to that. A man by the name of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Verse 59. While they were stoning him, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's a good word, huh, says. Receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, watch this, watch this. Do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Those words, he fell asleep, is a New Testament metaphor for he died. His last breath on earth was his first one in heaven. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, this is proof of a changed heart. Maybe somebody's done you wrong. You're going to have to let it go and forgive that person. That doesn't mean you have to walk hand in hand with the person who has hurt you or a family member so deeply. But in your heart of hearts, if you can't forgive them, man, I'll tell you what, God can't forgive you. He's already said that in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. you got to forgive. And that's the beauty. I, I, can't, I can't say this unless I've experienced it in my own life. You have to learn how to forgive, but it's the forgiveness of God, the pardon of God. So, but this is true proof of real forgiveness in action. There are stories that we have heard of people uh, who have been murdered by someone and that someone may have gone to prison for the rest of his or her life, but they asked for the family to come and they asked for forgiveness. Hey, I'll tell you what, just a little, little reminder of this. When my sister died uh, at the hands of a drunken driver, he came to my house the next day, asked me for forgiveness as well as my family, and I led him to Jesus Christ in prayer. And that's, that's, I just want you to know that the forgiveness is there. You can do this. So don't tell me, Pastor, you don't know how deeply I've been hurt. I may not know your personal situation, but I do know this. According to Stephen's life, you can be forgiven and you can say, Lord, don't lay this sin at them. They don't know what they're doing. No wonder Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen. The story of a Sunday school uh, a children's class. And uh, the teacher asked the children, uh, children, do you know, do you know what, uh, do you know what uh, the Bible says about married couples? Do you know what God said about people that are married? And one child says, yes, I know. Uh, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Uh, forgive them. Yeah. 
You know, there may be an element of truth to that. I don't know. Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Right now, they're just feeling the palpitations of the heart. That's the reason why we have classes for people that are getting married, so that I have six weeks to talk them out of it if I can. <laughs> I'll tell you what. But real forgiveness is an awesome thing. It really, really is. So again, he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. That's proof of a changed heart. So it says something about the beauty and the power of forgiveness. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I said all of that for the understanding of what I'm about to tell you. What I'm about to tell you is something that I want you to hear. This is where anti-Christianity is clearly evidenced just as it was or is or shall be with anti-Semitism. Anti-Christianity uh, walks hand in hand with anti-Christianity with anti-Semitism. Anti Look at Acts chapter 8 verse 1. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, okay, underline this in your Bible. That's why you bring your Bibles to church. Because there's going to be a test. Huh? I'm going to stand at the door while Pastor Grace leads us in a closing prayer. I'm going to ask you, okay, what did the Bible say? <laughs> I'm not really going to do that, right? I could, but I'm not. But I could. <laughs> it says, on that day, a great persecution, great, persecu great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. I'm going to read it again. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So something began that hadn't really been to such an extent before. Now, do any of you know when that ended, the persecution against the church? Huh? It hasn't. Thank you. It's still going on today. Maybe in different forms, but it's still going on. Look at verse 2. Godly men buried Stephen and more deeply for him. Are you following along? But Saul began to destroy the church. Remember, God changed his life and used him to write nearly half the New Testament. Isn't that incredible? But Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off. Everybody say dragged off. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Well, the fact that Saul dragged off the Christians, according to Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, he describes the intensity of his hatred and his hostility toward Christians, towards the Christian church, before giving his life to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, if God could use Paul to write nearly half the New Testament after the devil used him in the killing of many Christians, don't you think that God can forgive you of everything you've ever done to him or to anybody else or to yourself? If God can forgive Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, God can forgive you too. Right, hey, let's just take a moment and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm not worthy of it. I don't even deserve it, Lord, but I'm going to trust you for your forgiving power. So let me go a little bit further. Paul the Apostle, we see that he repented of his sin and asked Jesus Christ to come into his life to be his Savior and his Lord. But here's the question. If God could use Paul in the way that he did after the devil used him to persecute many Christians, don't you think that God can forgive that person who hurt you badly. Don't you think God can forgive that person who nearly destroyed your life, your marriage, your relationship, your physical health? Don't you think that God could forgive them too? I say yes, He can. Give the Lord a praise for that because some of you have been forgiven even though you've hurt others. So that's a good thing. But listen, we got to stay focused. We do. you got to stay focused on God's forgiveness and His forgiving plan. Now let's take this study of what's happening as it relates to Israel and the Jewish people. Are you following along? The vast majority of Arabs, Lord, what we're going to cover, you cover us. Protect us, Lord God, as we take this message. The vast majority of Arabs around the world are Muslim, which means that the main religion of most Arabs is the religion of Islam. As a religion, Islam has always had, from its beginning, an anti-Jewish, anti-Christian character and message. Furthermore, Muslim teachings have always justified their anti-Jewish, anti-Christian agenda as a religious cause. I'm going to prove this. They have justified their hatred towards the Jews and Christians as a 
quote-unquote religious cause. And that's the reason why many of them are willing to die for what they believe. Now, if they are willing to do that, how much more for you and I to believe the truth are willing to die and live for Jesus Christ? In fact, anti-Semitism is clearly taught and influenced in most of the public schools in the Middle East, uh, Arab countries. Here's just one example of how prominent anti-Semitism and anti-Christianity is in these Arab countries. An Egyptian ninth grade textbook states, this is a ninth grade textbook for our children to learn, and I quote, Israel hopes to be the homeland of the Jews, and they, speaking about the Jews, have the stubbornness of 4,000 years of a history behind them. But Israel, this textbook goes on to say, shall not live if the Arabs, uh, but Israel shall not live if the Arabs stand fast in their hatred. It goes on to say, Israel shall wither and decline even if all the human race and the devil in hell conspire to help her. She shall not exist. End of quote. What are we saying? Where you find anti-Semitism, you will find anti-Christianity because true biblical Christianity will embrace Israel and the Jewish people as a part of God's plan for the ages. Anti-Semitism is clearly influenced in most of the media throughout the Arab and Muslim world. El Maktour, El Islami, which is a religious publication, had this particular statement in one of its editions. Quote, The Jews were responsible for World War II. They, this publication states, they, the Jews, initiated this war in order to crush Nazi Germany which was the last obstacle before Jewish domination of the world. Europe has indeed destroyed and Zion, Europe has indeed destroyed and Zionist strategy had its victory. The Jews were also behind the murder of President Abraham Lincoln. End of quote. Yeah. Another one, El Nur, another publication of the Muslim Brotherhood was made this statement, quote we wait for the moment that all Jews will gather in Palestine and that will be the great day of enormous massacre, end of quote. Do you understand what's going on? Again, where you find anti-Semitism, you will find anti-Christianity because God's design for the Christian church is to embrace the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. We'll read that scripture one more time in just a moment's time. That's just another of the examples. Here's another one. El Tahuit. A fundamental Islamic publication made this statement. And you know, when I read this, I read this with a very special covering. I, I read this with a very special trust in God that He's going, because we're, 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 we're stomping on enemy territory, okay? But we pray, and that's what we do. So it made this statement The children of Israel, quote, the children of Israel are garbage, allied with Satan. They believe in the devil. Again, it says, The children of Israel are garbage allied with Satan, causing pain and infection, a deposit of germs. You saw the story two weeks ago about the Holocaust. Ladies and gentlemen, we're dealing with serious matters. That's the reason why I'm covering this. I could tell you about how to prosper, but that's not what you want to hear, and that's not the main message of the hour. God will supply your every need. I could tell you how to do this and how to do that and get a great career, but I want to tell you as a part of preparation for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ what the truth needs to be preached. According to Bible prophecy... The same hatred that many of the Arab Muslims have toward the Jewish people is what will inevitably provoke and lead to the worst bloodbath the world has ever seen or will have seen. I'm talking about what the Bible projects as the greatest war of all time, the final battle, the battle of Armageddon. It's a real thing. You know, they've tried with attempts to make movies about Armageddon. Nothing can compare to what the Bible says is going to happen on that day when Jesus Christ comes back to earth the second time. So again, these are all major signs of the times and of the end of the age. And we have to realize where we're at. I love the joy that we have, but I tell you what, we're not playing with things here. So the message for such a time as this, number one. Number one. Where you find anti-Semitism, you will find anti-Christianity. Because true biblical Christianity embraces Israel and the Jewish people as part of God's plan for the ages. Second of all, and there's four of them that I want you to remember. If you are a blessing to Israel and the Jewish people, God promises to bless you. Period. Number three. If you are a blessing to Israel and to the Jewish people, Satan will hate you and will instigate persecution against you and the Jewish people. That's number three. 
Number four, whoever curses Israel and the Jewish people, God will curse with divine judgment those who have tried to bring a curse against Israel. And he will not fail. God doesn't fail. It's not in his nature to fail. He succeeds in everything that he says is going to happen. We've read from Genesis chapter 12 in part two of this series, but it bears repeating from time to time. Would it be okay with you and I if we read those few verses of Scripture once again to solidify our understanding? Here it is, Genesis 12, verse 1. If you remember this chapter, the first three verses, you're doing well. Genesis 12 and verse 1, The Lord had said to Abram, and God changed his name to Abraham. God changes names for a purpose and for a reason. Amen? Now, I used to think, Lord, why, why don't you change my name? Huh? Hey, Pastor Grace tells the story when she was a little girl. She didn't want the name Grace. She wanted the name Evelyn. Now, Evelyn, wherever you're at, you're a beautiful person, okay? But then when she got saved, she said, I love my name, Grace. So, you know, I don't know. Maybe God will change my name to, uh, let's see. Now, in Spanish, it's Rogelio Juan Florentin Martin Majimoya Matadores de Toros y Bravas Chivas Lucrecia y Lucero de Pueblo. Uh, that's, that's my name in Spanish. So maybe he will change it too. No, <laughs> I'm very satisfied with my name. The word Roger means a warrior with a spear. That's all the warrior needs. But, but it's a German name, which means warrior with a spear, and he knows how to use it. You know, the Bible is described as the sword, but also a spear. All right, so again, he said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. And it's all that land right there. Woo! Oh, okay, okay, I, I'm getting excited now. Verse 2 says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and, and you will be a blessing. Whoever blesses you. They will be blessed. But I will also curse whoever curses you and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. God said that I will curse. You may not picture God as one who curses, but the Bible does tell us whoever curses Israel will be cursed as well. Now, the Muslims in Islam, they have a so-called holy book. And it's called the Quran. Q-U-R-A-N, sometimes it's spelled with a K. But it was published in 631 A.D., centuries after the establishment of God's Word, canon of scriptures we call it. But the Quran denounces the very existence of Jews and Christians. I'm not going to say this unless I have evidence for this. The following is a sample from the Quran, and we ask God's protection for exposing these things. Verse 51 of the al Madai. I hope I'm pronouncing it correct. But it says in that 51st verse of their so-called holy book, Take neither, quote, Take neither Jew nor Christian for your friend with one another. Whoever of you seeks their friendship shall become one of their number. Allah does not guide the wrongdoer. It goes on to say in another section, Taste ye, meaning the Jews, the punishment of burning. And then it goes on to say in another section, Because of the wrongdoing of the Jews... And of their, now we understand what's going on over there and all over the world. It says, because of the wrongdoing of the Jews and of their devouring people's wealth, wealth by false pretenses, we have prepared for those of them who believe a painful doom. End of quote. Another quotation from the Quran Allah hath cursed them, meaning the Jews, for their disbelief. Another statement. They, meaning the Jews, will spare no pains to corrupt you. They desire nothing but your ruin. Their hatred is clear from what they say, but more violent is the hatred which their breasts conceal. End of quote. Another quotation. The most vehement of mankind is hostility toward the Jews and the idolaters. Hmm? Do you see how the devil works? Whatever he's doing... He tries to blame others for doing that. No wonder when uh, Hamas attacked Israel on October the 7th, 2023, a lot of people who were the pro-Palestinian movement people, they said it's Israel's fault that they were attacked. Huh? And we see this here as well, where the devil will say, see, that's what they're doing. And yet, he's a liar. We've quoted from Luke in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verse 17, more than once, and we'll probably quote it several more times. It's, the word, it's a word to the Jews, and it's also a word to Christians. Verse 17 says, all men will hate you, Jesus said this, because of me. 
So the more we know this, brother, the, the, the more st- stable we're going to be. Am I right? Look at verse 7. Back up to the 7th verse of Luke 21, verse 7. Teacher, they asked, when will all of these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He said, he replied, watch out that you are not deceived. That's the first message that God gave to those who asked what will be the sign of the times. Watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. Then in Luke 21, 16, Jesus said, you will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Then in verse 18, he states, not a hair of your head will perish. Now, i got to explain this because a lot of people don't understand. They think that there's a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. So it's a prophetic statement which means that the children of God will be in the care of God forever and forever, including in the final hour. That's what that means. In other words, God never promised His children an escape from death. You're, you're going to die unless the rapture happens before that time. But uh, He promised that the destiny of true Christians will be in the hands of God rather than in the hands of men. And we've seen that in Stephen's life. So why is all of this so important? It's a, this is a particular important uh, thing because sometimes we pray for God's protection over our loved ones, and that's a good thing. Lord, protect them as they travel from here to there, from there to here. We do that. Protect my children. Protect my family, my friends. And when we pray, we really believe it by faith that God is going to protect them. God is more honored with your faith than what actually happens. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's, that's the word. And yet, when something tragic takes place uh, where either our loved ones get hurt or our loved ones die, we think, God, have you written us off? God has never written you off. Don't ever think, Lord, where were you in all of this? He was there all the time. How about we just give God an honoring praise of thanksgiving, okay? (laughs) Do I have just a few more minutes of your attention? Fact number one, God's protection goes far beyond the here and now. He wants us to think in terms of eternity and in the spiritual realm. Fact number two, the children of God will be in the care of God until the final hour. Number three, fact number three, God never promised His children an escape from death, but that their destiny is in the hands of God rather than in the hands of man. Let this minister to your heart. There is a well-known poem entitled, First... They came. It's the poetic form of a 1946 post-war publication by a German pastor and a theologian by the name of Martin Niemöller. Maybe you've read this or you've read about this. But it's about the cowardly people of his day shortly after the Jewish Holocaust. He exposed some of the world leaders of his day who could have done something about the Holocaust or to help stop the Holocaust, but they did not for one reason or another. He included believers and even some ministers who could have done something about the Holocaust but did not for one reason or another. He even included himself in the cowardly uh, list of people of somebody who could have done something but he did not do it. Well, it came about as a result of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi regime's rise to power and how it came in phases, in increments, starting small and accepted by most. It deals with themes of persecution Guilt, repentance, and personal responsibility. Where can one find this writing? The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum quotes the following, and these are his words. In Nazi Germany, first they came for the socialists, but I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, but I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, but I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, But by that time, there was no one left to speak out for me. So this author by the name of Martin Niemöller was a conservative Christian man like most Christian pastors are. He became the leader of a group of German ministers opposed to Hitler's agenda. He was arrested in the year of 1937 when all of this was happening, at least the beginning of it. He was sent to the Dachau concentration camp until he was eventually released by the Allies after the war. This German pastor by the name of Martin Niemöller passed away in the year of 1984 at the age of 92. And the words will be remembered. First, they came. I want to be able to do something to help people or to express the blessings of God upon Israel and the Jewish people. So I end with what I started. 
Where you find anti-Semitism, you will also find anti-Christianity. Because true biblical Christianity embraces Israel and the Jewish people as a part of God's plan for the ages. God's plan is awesome, isn't it? It's a powerful thing. There may have been something that spoke to your heart here in the midst of this segment of our Bible series. Embrace it as you embrace the plan of God. He loves you. And not only does He love you, but He also wants to show you how much He's got victory in store for you. Huh? And all He asks is that we give Him our hearts and that we stay focused, that we keep our eyes on Him because we have eyes to see, so He desires that we see Him. And also that we hear Him. We can hear His voice. We have ears to hear, but are we hearing and listening? I don't ever want to stay, say, Lord, I'm not listening. Yeah, there are times when he says, here's what I want you to do, my child. And uh, we have to be ready to say, Lord, here I am. Send me. I will do what you want me to do. I will be my brother's keeper. Bow your heads. And close your eyes. Humble your heart. You can't go wrong with this. No religion died for you on the cross. Jesus did. No pastor, priest, or pope, or cardinal died for you on the cross, but Jesus did. I can accurately say this. No saint, doesn't matter who, died for you on the cross by the shedding of his or her blood, but Jesus did. Jesus did. Amen. Father, as we make this fresh new commitment to you, it's to you. Lord, it's not to this church or that church or that affiliation. It's to you. I want everybody under the sound of this voice here in the sanctuary and those of you watching at this time. Say this after me. Dear God, you really do love me. And this I understand, that I will be persecuted for my faith, for my stand. So I expect that this will happen. But I choose to be prepared by the power of your Spirit to give an answer and to overcome. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. And Lord, where I have sinned against you, I am so sorry. Have mercy on me and forgive me because you died for me. So now I'm asking you by faith, live in my heart as my personal Savior and my Lord. Come into my life as I give you my everything. I am now washed in the blood of Jesus and I am saved. I will remain faithful by your power. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. If you live in the Pueblo area or if you're visiting in this area from out of town, we'd love for you to join us for a time of worship at Abundant Life Church, located at 1001 Constitution Road in the Belmont area of Pueblo. The time of our services are 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings and 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. We at Abundant Life Church believe you'll find a loving group of people here and an exciting atmosphere of fellowship, hope, and encouragement. We look forward to seeing you. The light shines on the cross. Where once a man did die He said I'm coming back again This he testified He said it was his father's will That's why I must do this Again he said I'm coming back So please consider this My father's too There'll be no turning back When you head up towards the sky You'll hear the trumpet blow In the sweet by and by